I am Alexander uh, from uh, a small uh, game development company uh, based in Kiev, Ukraine, Starny Games. And today we'll talk about Ukraine war stories, uh, the project that we released about the uh, first months of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, what actual information you will get from this talk is uh, how to develop a project with highly controversial subject and control potential risks, uh, how to promote a small indie project and release it on Steam in 12 languages. I will also touch on uh, how we utilized Steam Next first. Um, also, how to produce an impactful game with a very limited time and resources during the war, uh, how to make a demo in two weeks, and the most important part, uh, how to be transparent and communicate your project ideas to players and community and media clearly. So, uh, just quickly uh, to catch up on uh, what was our studio uh, before the war started. So. Uh, we are a small team that developed and self-published a number of hardcore strategy titles on Steam, uh, mostly Strategic Mind series, and we have uh, the last game in the series still in development, Strategic Mind Spirit of Liberty at the bottom right corner. You can see it, and it's actually dedicated to Finland in World War II. Uh, so, uh, we've really studied uh, a lot the history of Finland during that period, like I've read the uh, Mannerheim memoirs and so on. So, I cannot help but find a lot of similarities uh, in uh, between what was happening back then in Finland and what's happening in Ukraine right now. And yeah, I was really impressed by uh, how your country uh, overcame all these uh, terrible uh, events and, you know, uh, saved it independence. So yes, and uh, we are also working together with a British publisher Slytherin on a headquarters World War II project. But when the war started, uh, we sort of put all of that on hold for a while. And we also thought about uh, developing a game about uh, the events around us. And uh, so why do we even started doing that? First of all, we were affected by the events of the war, by what happened in uh, Bucha, Hostomel, Mariupol, and many other places, many other places uh, in Ukraine. Also, uh, of course, we've made some donations, uh, like to army and charities. But you know, making games is something we excel at, and we thought that we should utilize our strongest side and like help not only with donations, but also by uh, making a game that would help uh, spread accurate information about what's going on and, you know, uh, allow people across the world to know more about the events in Ukraine. Um, so, um, yeah, we really wanted to make a difference and to try and help our country, uh, but also to do it in an artistic way and form basically something that we do uh, as our uh, job. So, of course, I know, I think you're pretty much aware of what's going on in Ukraine and many probably follow that closely, so I won't stop on this part too much, but basically a year ago on February 24th, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And here is the map on the second day of the war. So as you can see, there are like different red areas all across the country and Ukraine is a large uh, country. So Russia had to attack from both uh, Russian territory, Belarus territory and occupied Ukraine territory like Crimea. So uh, they've attacked from multiple directions, like they attacked uh, Finland from three directions during uh, 1939 and so on. So here is the peak of Russian advance near Kiev. Uh, this is basically the furthest they could get, and it was really close uh, to Kiev. Basically, they've occupied some of the suburbs, such as Bucha and Hostomel, which are two stories uh, in our project. Um, and here is uh, the evacuation route, how one of our employees uh, managed to evacuate to safety after being over a week uh, under Russian occupation in Bucha. So, um, 
So yeah, so the idea of the Ukraine war stories uh, belongs to Ihor. Uh, Ihor Timoshenko is our founder and CEO. Uh, he's a very experienced programmer and also a very creative person. So he suggested uh, doing this after being really um, horrified by um, the news from Bucha and many other uh, towns and villages in Ukraine. And basically uh, what he said is that he felt that, you know, reading a newspaper article saying, I don't know, like a dozen of people got killed in Ukraine or something like that, it doesn't really um, bring that impression, uh, th uh, that experience that the people uh, who saw all of these horrors themselves uh, experience, so it doesn't affect people so much. So he thought that we should not just inform, but to show people uh, from across the world what, what's going on and to make some sort of immersive experience about like civilian people uh, who were like shocked and surprised by the war and they were faced with challenges they never expected to face. Um, however, uh, when we just started talking to the team, I think not everyone uh, had the same like vision in their head of what we were suggesting. So some were cautious, like to the moral and ethical aspects of such project. So uh, we understood that we need to like uh, r really uh, put some things very clearly uh, so that all people on the team understand uh, what exactly are we going to do. And that's when they understood it and agreed. And we are really happy to work on this project. So we also used these um, principles to communicate our idea clearly to all of the people outside the team, like to the media, to the players, to the press and so on. So, um, and, um, Basically, the first uh, basic principle was this is a non-profit project. Uh, we do it as a charity using only our own funds and we do not get anything back. So even the $1,000 prize from Best Game Awarded Games Gathering was donated to keep true to this role. And yeah, basically uh, we didn't want to be seen as someone who try to earn some profit on other people's suffering or something like that. So we had to be very clear about this. Uh, second, we present only truths, do not exaggerate, invent or play with facts. Uh, we understood that it was very vi it was vital for the project to succeed because even if uh, there is a shade of doubt on any of the episodes we describe, it would basically undermine the whole project. So that's not something we would want. So, of course, it was in our best interest to double check everything 10 times and, you know, be super clear and super precise with all the information we present in our stories. So, yeah, we tried to verify information as thoroughly as we could and discarded anything that could be falsified or made up. And it actually helped us a lot because it turned out that some of the stories, uh, even some of the things that some uh, government officials uh, were like spreading some information that turned out uh, misinformation with no uh, factual support later on. So we discarded all of such um, controversial things and left only something we were sure uh, was correct and confirmed by uh, many people who've uh, witnessed of who've been uh, there and so on. And um, of course, after that, we had to made up names for the key characters and combine several real stories into one tale to first preserve people's privacy and second to allow some like gameplay choices and different outcomes for the story. And we also uh, pro uh, made a sources tab in the game uh, with links to reputable media uh, describing uh, similar events happening in the same area. Uh, so basically this way we confirmed that uh, our narrative is uh, really close to what was really happening there and everyone could open the sources tab and check the events uh, similar to what was happening in each of the stories. So with that in mind, everyone were happy to work on the game and many people supported us later uh, during the promotion campaign and everything like uh, 
people were happy to help us with spreading information about the project and so on. So uh, how did our development progress? Uh, at first, we just gathered some information, thought about the overall plot line and structure of the project, uh, talked to our colleague who just got out of uh, the occupation and uh, uh, rest a bit and so on. So talk to other people uh, who we knew, read a lot of reports, tried to verify them and so on. Uh, next, uh, there happened to be a public offer from a certain publisher uh, to make a bundle of games or demos about the war in Ukraine made by Ukrainian devs with a big cut going to charities. And it had a two week submission deadline. So that was tough, but that was a good like uh, opportunity to speed up the development and have some uh, very tough deadline to beat. So we decided to give it a try and we were planning to develop the game anyway. So we thought making a first story and submitting it would be a good start, uh, even if the bundle idea uh, doesn't work out in the end. And basically, uh, I was a little bit skeptical uh, about this, but we thought, you know, to give it a try. And it was very busy two weeks. Uh, we've already had some code and tools to produce the visual novel because we were making uh, some internal demo before the war started, but it wasn't finished. So in two weeks, we had to add some extra functionality and tools uh, uh, in the code, design UI, uh, implement UI, design the game and script it using our tools, write all the texts and review them, agree on the art style and produce the art assets, uh, put everything together, test and fix bugs. So that seems like a lot to handle in two weeks. Uh, but we've managed. So here is what we've got. Um, and basically we tried uh, to make the UI quite simple, but also the one that fits the setting. So here you can see the background art, the text area, the character portrait, the, uh, the, the interface. And here you can see the player making a choice in the story and how it affects different parameters in the game. Um, and so here uh, you can see some, some other screenshots from this first demo that we did. It actually became the first of the three stories uh, that we ended up doing. And here is the parameters tab with all the characters and their mood and some items you have. So, um, so we've uh, done that in two weeks and sent the demo to the, uh, to the publisher, but uh, the bundle idea didn't work out. Uh, they've said that all submitted project of all genre and they wanted to include on the horrors, so that bundle didn't happen. However, uh, we were sort of ready for this outcome and had a plan of how to self-publish our project. And we've used this uh, demo we did to set up a Steam page since we've already had uh, like the screenshots and the demo and everything. So uh, we just had to localize it into uh, eight languages um, and basically make all the descriptions and so on. Uh, and of course, for the Steam page, we also had to produce a short trailer. And trailer is something quite tricky to produce for a visual novel because it's very static and it's sort of based around text. So uh, you have to be really uh, creative to come up with a good trailer in this genre. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, and we had to do one really fast. Uh, so uh, here is what we've got.
Uh, okay, so so this was our uh, basically trailer video that we've managed to come up with, and uh, we've also per just opened the Steam page just in time for the uh, Games Gathering Summer to compete uh, in the Indie Blast competition, and uh, we won the Best Game Award there which is probably not very surprising considering it's Ukrainian organizers, but was still, uh, you know, some moment to celebrate for the team. And uh, we've also started our marketing campaign around that point, and we've asked a lot of people, so we didn't pay anyone, we've just asked uh, many people from the industry we knew and different organizations if they could help us uh, for free, because it was a basically, you know, charity project aimed at uh, helping Ukraine. So uh, many people volunteered to help us in various ways, and I'm really thankful to each of them. Uh, so uh, also initially we've planned eight languages that we would pay for, uh, but those became 12 uh, at release. So how did that happen? First, we've got players from Japan who joined our Discord and offered to do a Japanese localization. So we were really happy about that. And after that, uh, we called upon Reddit to find uh, volunteers for traditional Chinese and Finnish language. And then our uh, Korean tr translator uh, dropped out halfway uh, through. So uh, we had to also ask for volunteers to help and to come to rescue. And finally, uh, Disorder Software from Brazil volunteered to help us with the Portuguese Brazil localization. Uh, so thanks to everyone. And of course, thanks to the uh, Finnish volunteers. And now all of you can play the game either in English or in Finnish as you prefer. Um, so um, also uh, here are all three stories. So those are basically Hostomel, Butch and Mariupol and you choose, you can choose any of them uh, to play uh, and you know, to go through. And here is uh, how we presented the evidence to some of the events. Uh, so sort of these are the events similar to what some of what we describe uh, in our stories with links to the articles uh, where People can find some external proof that we are not making all of this up. Um, yeah, I would also uh, like to make a quick art review. So uh, we had several goals to meet with our artistic approach. And the first one was meet the very tough deadlines. And you know, it's really important. And especially with this project, uh, we didn't want to develop it too long because we wanted to help Ukraine like as soon as possible. And so we had to find balance between releasing it uh, as soon as possible while also having enough time to develop, localize and market the game basically so that more people would play it. So we thought the October, uh, we started in May and we thought October 2022 would be, uh, you know, the earliest possible date. And it also allowed us to participate in the Steam Next Fest. Um, so we also wanted to provide high level of visual fidelity so that the people could see the actual town we are describing and the actual houses that are really uh, exist in the town and so on. And we wanted it to help with immersion and atmosphere. So to reach these goals, we decided on the following. Um, we did a very minimalistic and easy to implement UI, but making sure it fits the setting. Uh, for background arts, we used real photos as references and then produced an oil painting like art that resembled the photographs with some adjustments. And for characters and items, we used a similar uh, realistic oil painting style. So I think it uh, worked out quite well in the end and it allowed us to meet our deadlines. So we were quite happy with this. So here are some more examples of uh, what we've got in the end. Um, and uh, yeah, so next step was uh, Ukrainian Games Festival on Steam in August. Uh, so I've recorded my uh, gameplay where I narrated one of the stories and we've run it as a broadcast throughout the event. Um, so yeah. 
and uh, let's jump into the marketing review. So we had a noticeable influx of wish lists after some media in Japan and Taiwan released materials about the game. Uh, so you can see that on the graph below. Uh, another uh, surge was a Ukrainian games festival on Steam. Uh, it's actually uh, quite useful and an opportunity to showcase the demo. Uh, later, almost at some random point, we've got attention from big Ukrainian media, not media, not just game dev ones, but the general media and some foreign media as well. So in our previous games, I don't think we've got uh, that much uh, coverage and well, basically we've got some coverage, but it never transferred to a wishlist uh, so well. And of course, the largest influx of wishlist was uh, Steam Next Fest. Uh, and then another uh, surge with popular upcoming right before release. So at the graph below, you can see like the wishlists, uh, daily wishlist editions and uh, that's uh, right before release, so maybe a day or two before release. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, that's how our uh, promotion activities worked. And then um, the Steam Next Fest was, of course, the largest uh, influx of wish lists. And here are some tips for you. So we've got around 9,000 wish lists uh, throughout this week of uh, Steam Next Fest in October. So um, basically, uh, before the event starts, uh, use. So first of all, first of all, you need to register in advance. For example, we opened the Steam page. If we just barely uh, had enough time to register for the event in October, so you, you have to register a few months in advance. For example, right now, if you you have any games that you aim to participate with at Steam Next Fest in June 2023, uh, you would have to register right now because it closes in a week, basically. So you, you need to really uh, be ready in advance. Uh, and it's best to use the Steam Next Fest that's before your release. So if you plan to develop your game for the next year or so, then just skip all the next fests until the ones that's right before your release, basically. Mm, uh, so use the event preview page to see where your game is displayed and where not uh, at the Steam Next Fest page and adjust some text if needed, if you missed something important and so on. Uh, then run your uh, broadcast uh, throughout the week um, because people could see it at any time. They are from various countries and it's okay if you just put it on repeat. Uh, make good use of two priority slots for broadcasts uh, that are displayed at the top of the broadcast list. Uh, I suggest having them during the first days when there are more traffic going from uh, Steam uh, main page. And yeah, of course, don't miss registration. It ends well in advance. So now the last step was um, making the most of the popular upcoming tab on Steam. So that's where uh, you reach a certain amount of wish lists. Your game is displayed here in chronological order until release. Uh, but you could also uh, try to calculate that and you know choose a specific date so that your game will be displayed here a little bit longer because it depends on the other games uh, that are being released. And basically we did that and got another uh, wishlist boost from this. Uh, and finally, uh, we've arrived at our Steam release on uh, 18th of October, 2022. So I invite everyone to check out our Steam page. If you can help us spread the information about the project, uh, please do. You'll have our utmost gratitude. And now we can look back and see. So today is March 6th. So I've collected the data yesterday, uh, March 5th. And uh, we had uh, basically almost 800 uh, total reviews of which 87% uh, were positive. And we are really happy about that because I didn't expect this number to be so high because of the nature of the project. So we had lots of like trolls, pro-Russian people like saying, you know, spamming negative reviews with Putin face or something like that. So uh, despite all that, we still we are still close to 90% positive reviews. So we are really uh, happy about that. And yeah, uh, and we think our project succeeded. So um, 
I hope you also have a time to check it out and would it would be interesting to you as well. And I invite you to support Ukraine. And in the game, we have a tab where you can uh, with links to some charity organizations in Ukraine. So feel free uh, to do just that and support our country. And thanks everyone for attention and have a great day. All right, yeah. Um, thank you, Alexander, for your talk. Sorry for the technical uh, challenges with the mic here. Um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm happy to listen to any questions uh, you or uh, people listening could have. So I would be happy to answer this. Yes. So let's have a couple of questions. Anything in the audience? Just raise your hand, and a mic will come to you. And I'm going to start with one question before that. So just tell us a little bit about, it's, it's not too long after the release, but what kind of reception have you gotten other than just uh, the statistics of the reviews? Is there anything else that you could share with us about people, uh, how people have perceived the game? Yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, we've had uh, a demo on Steam since uh, July, basically. So the first uh, feedback came to us even before we released the project. And we had feedback from people from different countries, like we had people from Germany telling us that like it's, you know, it's heartbreaking and like they had to stop several times like to cry and come back and keep uh, following the story to finish that and that it's really impacted them and uh, that they were following the situation in Ukraine and they sort of shared it with people they knew and uh, were really supportive of our initiative and thought that it was uh, important. So yeah, we've, we've got a lot of positive feedback like that. And you know, we tried not to turn this into a like horror game or like some, you know, something that would be too horrible for people to even finish reading. So we tried to, you know, keep the balance between like not diminishing uh, the horror that happened there, but also making it so that people could digest that and, you know, finish the game and not just quit. Uh, so we had to find that balance. And I think based on responses and reviews and feedback, uh, we've, um, you know, achieved uh, quite decent results in that. Yeah. Any questions? If not, I'm going to ask another one. So. Uh, there was a student uh, asking about whether you're planning for more content uh, uh, for the game to have like additional stories coming up. Is that something that you are continuing developing? Yeah, so we had a lot of ideas, uh, but it's sort of uh, difficult uh, throughout various perspectives. So uh, for this project, uh, we currently uh, do not plan to add any new stories soon so it's possible that we would make another project like after the war ends or something which would be like larger one uh, but we don't have any concrete plans on that and right now i think these three stories they are very representative and they sort of serve the purpose and they like showcase really well what's going on here I, we feel like adding more stories, it uh, uh, wouldn't be as beneficial, but of course there is a lot to tell about the events of this war. So uh, maybe we'll do something like that uh, after the war ends. But it's also problematic to make a larger project like that because, you know, it's self-funded. So it, it's hard to find the funds for a bigger one, basically, since we are a small company. so. Uh, for now, uh, we are happy with, with what we have right now, and we will see what we can do later on. Okay. Well, we're looking forward to uh, play play your games, also the, the other games that you're developing, and good luck with everything, and let's hope that the war is over as soon as possible. So uh, thanks. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, you Alexander, much. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot. Have a good day and good remaining and the rest of the conference.